the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most, Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have yes, sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have not done done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and so for his sake forgives you all your sins. As called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
The Old Testament reading for this, the fourth Sunday of Easter, is from Lamentations, chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he caused grief, he will have compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is read from 1 Peter, chapter 2. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. According to St. John, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This is the Gospel of our Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten as His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who through our sin and through our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Having just said our Alleluia's, having just proclaimed that Christ is indeed risen, and so having reminded ourselves that we are still in the Easter season, you and I need not share the confusion of the apostles in this morning's gospel reading. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus had told them, a little while and you will see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. To which the disciples responded by conferring with one another and saying, what is this he says to us? What does he mean? We do not know what he's talking about. But with the commemoration of our Lord's resurrection only three weeks behind us, we know what it is that he says, what he means, what it is that he is talking about. Because, of course, it would be just a little while, just a matter of hours, in fact, after that conversation in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Christ would be crucified, that he would die and would be buried. And so the disciples would see him no longer. But so, too, it would be just a little while, just a matter of days, before he rose from death and the grave and appeared in the upper room, where his disciples again saw him. Jesus told them these things would happen, and so these things did, in fact, happen. Now, that these things did happen, and happened before you or I ever heard or read about them, does give us some small advantage over the apostles. Because when we hear Jesus say, a little while and you will see me no longer, and again, a little while and you will see me, we know what he means because we know what happens next. Of course, to be sure, the disciples should have known what happens next. Jesus hadn't at all kept it a secret from them. No fewer than three times he had explained to them that he was going to Jerusalem to die and to rise again. So the problem wasn't so much the fact that the disciples didn't know what happens next. No, far more problematic is the fact that although they had been told what would happen, they didn't believe it. Recall again Peter's own response when Jesus quite explicitly explained to him that he was going to Jerusalem to die. That'll never happen, Peter said. Recall the response of all of the disciples when it did happen. Did they rejoice in the remembrance of John the Baptist's proclamation that Christ's death would be that of a sacrificial lamb which would take away the sins of the world? Did they thank and praise God that Jesus' blood had been poured out as he said it would be for many? for the forgiveness of sins? Or did they comfort one another with the Lord's own promise that despite his death and burial, in three days' time he would rise again, and that in a little while they would see him? We all know the answers to those questions. No, no, and no because they didn't believe it. And so instead, they did exactly what Jesus knew they would do, exactly what Jesus said they would do. They wept, they lamented, they were sorrowful. Jesus told them that would happen, and so it happened. 
but only for a little while. Because that too, he told them, and so that too would come to pass. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrows will turn into joy. And so it did on that first Easter. So it did after a little while, when they saw him again, or more importantly, when he saw them. I will see you again, he had told them, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. And once again, as Jesus said it would be, so it was. Because on the evidence of everything that we read from this point forward, no one did take that joy away from the disciples. Not by shaming them, not by mocking them or threatening them, not by imprisoning them or persecuting them or even killing them. No, as the Apostle Paul would write to the Romans, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice even in our sufferings. And so it's no wonder that even to this day, and despite their initial doubts and discouragements and disbelief, the church holds up as models, as heroes of faith, these early apostles and evangelists, confessors and martyrs, those who, like St. Paul, would be whipped, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, in danger, in hunger, in thirst, and yet whose sufferings did not dissuade them from proclaiming the good news of Christ's death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. St. Paul says, such sufferings he rejoiced in. And so we too rejoice that he and so many others did, so that the gospel might endure, that it thereby survived and was spread, passed down even to you and to me, that we too might hear the good news and believe it. But dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us hear and let us believe all that the Lord tells us even that which might not immediately strike us as good news. Any more than Jesus' prediction of his own death first struck his disciples as the good news that it truly was. So, for example, let us hear again the good news of this morning's Old Testament reading. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him put his mouth in the dust. Let him give his cheek to one who strikes. Let him be filled with insults. Let us hear again the good news of our epistle reading. This is a gracious thing, Peter says, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Let us hear even the well-known words of our Lord himself, who says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evils against you falsely on my account. Let us hear this, and then let us ask ourselves honestly, do we believe it? Do we believe that it might be a good thing, even a blessed thing, to be insulted or even struck. That it's a good and gracious thing to endure sorrow or suffer unjustly. By most measures, including our grumbling about such things, I dare say it appears we do not believe it. And what's more, we probably don't want to believe it. 
And so we're unlikely to heed the words of St. Peter that follow on from this morning's epistle reading. To the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Or heed the words of Christ's own exhortation. When others revile you and persecute you on my account, rejoice and be glad. Which is to say, we very likely find ourselves in precisely the position of those first disciples in our gospel reading. Those disciples before Easter, who had heard repeatedly that it would be good, that it's the will of our good and gracious God that Jesus suffer and die, that his blood be poured out for the forgiveness of sins, but they didn't believe it, and they didn't want to believe it, and so they could not rejoice when it came to pass. But it did come to pass. Jesus told them it would happen, and so it happened. And so we have to ask ourselves also, what, what has he told us will happen? And therefore, what will happen? Well, in the verses shortly before this morning's gospel, he tells us very plainly, just as he told his first disciples, because you are not of the world, the world will hate you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And so he tells us, just as we heard him tell his first disciples, truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament. You will be sorrowful. Truly, truly. One of the things that Jesus says when he wants us to know that he's being really serious this will happen, he says. And so it has, and so it does, and so it will. You do and you will suffer and sorrow. Not only and probably not primarily by God's grace, the kind of persecution suffered by the apostles. But the world, the devil, and your own sinful flesh will not leave you in peace. You do and you will suffer. For example, temptation. You do and you will sorrow. For example, when you succumb to temptation. And in your suffering and in your sorrow, you will even, like these first disciples, be tempted to despair, to believe that your Lord has gone away and is not returning. And so here again, his sure and certain promise that he has not gone away, that he will not and cannot abandon you. A little while, and you will see me. He said it will happen, and it will happen. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. He said it would come to pass, and so it will come to pass. You will be sorrowful now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Your sorrows and your griefs, your anxieties and your distresses, those will be taken from you. Those are but for a little while. But the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Even in this little while that we do not see him face to face. We therefore recall, and by the grace of God, we believe his sure, his certain promise that he is indeed with us and for us. That though sin, death, and devil might continue to harass for a little while, therefore, uh, nonetheless, their ultimate defeat has already been accomplished. 
and neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Hearing and believing this good news, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us therefore, even in this little while, even in this midst of brief suffering and sorrow, rejoice and be glad, confident that the sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, the glory that is the risen Christ. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. And now, may this true peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. that you have bestowed on us without any merit or worthiness on our part. We praise you especially for preserving for us your saving word and the holy sacraments. Grant and preserve to your holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and provide faithful pastors to preach your word with power. Help all who hear the word rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send laborers into your harvest and open the door of faith to those who do not know you. In mercy, bring to repentance the enemies of your church and grant them amendment of life. Protect and defend your church in all tribulation and act danger. Strengthen us and all fellow Christians to set our hope fully on the grace revealed in Christ and help us to fight the good fight of faith that in the end we may receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow your grace on all nations of the earth. Bless especially this our country, its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy and truth, righteousness and peace may abound in all places. We commend to you the care of our schools, 
so that our children may grow in useful knowledge and Christian virtue and thus bring forth wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamity by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, and from every other evil. Protect and prosper all who labor in their rightful callings, and let all useful arts flourish among us. Be the God and Father of the lonely and the forsaken, the helper of the sick and needy, the comforter of the distressed and those who sorrow. Accept, we implore you, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before you as our humble service. Grant your Holy Spirit to those who come to the Lord's table this day, that they may receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ in sincere repentance and firm faith and to their abundant blessing. As we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come doing the work you have given us to do while it is day, before the night comes when no one can work. And when our last hour comes, support us by your power and receive us into your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Give to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, and most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying he has destroyed death, and by his rising again he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. 
gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Oh.